live. I'm just waiting for Pear to live stream. But for those of you just joining us, let us know in the chat what your favorite fall activity is, or whether you're a UX designer, UX researcher, and what is your favorite form of caffeine? Um, just because I see in the chat, a lot of y'all are interested in caffeine. Oh, running. I, I love running. Running is funny. Common running is funny if you also like running in the chat <laughs> as well. Cool. So we are live. Welcome, everyone. Um, if y'all are new to Design Buddies, welcome. I'm going to share my screen really quick, just a brief intro overview. Um, feel free to turn on your camera as well. We also have some fun Zoom backgrounds, but Design Buddies, we're a really wholesome design community. Um, we really just want to provide resources for all of y'all, no matter where you are in your design adventure. Um, we support a lot of designers, and I originally, I'm Grace, I founded Design Buddies in April of 2020, and, and since then we've kind of exploded. Um, we had a lot of massive growth since then, and full-time, I am a product designer at Electronic Arts based in the Bay Area. So, so I love design. I also run a huge design um, community, and we have a lot of resources like mentorship, events like this, portfolio reviews, and more. And we've done so many events. I think we're about like 70 or 80 now. Um, and this is all on social media, so definitely if you want to connect. We also have a newsletter that just launched. And... Um, just some house rules by re events are recorded um, so our buddies from other time zones can access it and by attending you grant consent if you don't wish to be recorded you can watch um, on our youtube channel so just search design buddies on youtube and you should be able to find it um, our youtube channel um, and feel free to engage via chat um, kind of this is kind of like the perks of online events where you can you can be loud you can like if something that our speakers say resonate with y'all feel free to just respond to it in the chat um, and also we really want to encourage y'all to connect with each other especially if y'all are earlier in a career it's good to meet other buddies and have a strong support system so we have a networking sheet that'll be dropped in the chat where you can connect with each other send each other a personalized linkedin invite saying that you met at this event um, and then for our questions um, please keep them on slido we will be dropping the link um, but we, we have a lot of questions prepared from what y'all submitted on Luma, but we also want to prioritize our live questions from our buddies. So um, on Slido, you can submit all of your questions and upvote each other. We'll also be doing group selfies afterwards as well. Um, so yeah, fun backgrounds, fun Zoom backgrounds that y'all can use for that as well. And if anything our speakers say resonate with y'all, definitely share your takeaways on social media, um, tag our speakers, tag design buddies. And lastly, feel free to hop into our Discord community to continue the conversation and, and partake in our wholesome fun and just have fun to be respectful. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and comment hype in the chat if you are super hyped for this. I feel like I'm a Twitch stream, but not really. So with that, <laughs> I had way too much caffeine today, as, as you can probably tell. <laughs> as you can see, we're super casual and wholesome here at Design Buddies. Um, we just want to create an environment where you'll feel um, really chill. And so with that, we're going to hand off to our wonderful speakers, um, Andres, Jasmine, and Chris. So I'm going to go in the order that we see on the screen, but we're going to go with our first question is, what are you doing now and how did you land your first UX job? So we're going to go with Andres first. Um, hi. Okay, cool. I'm not muted. Neat. Um, so I am a senior UX researcher at Lowe's currently. Uh, I used Before that, I worked for almost six years in the gaming industry for, for a contracting company in Florida. So how I got my job is that I got my... Uh, well, it's my current role or my first role? Your first UX role. Um, well, my boss was my teacher in college, so he got me the job. <laughs> Essentially, that was it. Uh, I did an internship for him while I was still in school. And because he saw a lot of the, a lot of the work that I did, he liked the way that I worked. Uh, he offered me a position, not only that, but because I am a foreigner, I had to get like a, either an internship or a full-time job in order for me to stay in the country. So he also did that to help me stay in the US. Awesome, thank you. I also got, I feel like if you're all in college, um, professors are also great 
source of networking, um, like great resources for you to potentially find your first job as well. So utilize that when you can. Um, yeah, we're gonna go with Jasmine next. Hello, I'm Jasmine. I'm a uh, designer at Autodesk. If you're not familiar with Autodesk, um, we're a global leader in the design and make technology space. Um, we have over 150 products and services covering many different industries. I'm specifically in the construction industry, which is a very interesting space. Um, and how I got my first job, my first job in, in, to, in product design was at a small company called education.com. And it made sense because I'm actually a career switcher. I used to teach high school and middle school science for about five years, decided that's not for me for forever. And so I um, did a boot camp type of thing, learned some of those skills and really utilized my network and my mentors to, to land my first job in that space. Yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Science is super fun. Like I love, that's like my favorite class in middle school <laughs> with science. <laughs> yeah. You know, with Chris next. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Chris Becker. Uh, I uh, currently am a uh, UX and product design consultant um, working for myself, uh, working with startups and uh, some advertising stuff here and there. Uh, my previous role was as a lead curriculum architect for a UX UI bootcamp that has been taught all around the world. Um, and my first UX role came out of uh, a colleague of mine from grad school. Um, I went to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and I had a master's degree in media design, which essentially, like all my colleagues from that from that program, are product or UX people because we learned human centered design and and prototyping. And a guy was like, "You'd be good for this. Come join this group." And so I uh, uh, took over. A, uh, there was a woman who had to go on. Uh, maternity leave and I took over her role for my first four months or whatever while she was gone that role ended quickly but once you get your foot in the door and you can show that you can do the thinking um, other doors open pretty quickly um, the first door sometimes is hard but you got to lean on your network and to just start sharing with everyone you're really interested if you show that you can do things and that you can think the way and just, you learn a ton along the way as you as you do so um, yeah just keep at it yeah, definitely plus one on that. I feel like getting, um, my first job was like the hardest, but once you get in, you have something on your resume to prove for and keep getting more and more. Um, I actually got my job at EA without applying. I was still networking, so networking is like super, super important. And I'm going to jump into some of the questions that were submitted by all of y'all on Luma. If you have any other questions for our speakers that you would like, really like to ask, please populate our Slido with that. Um, our friendly moderator, Shayna from Design Buddies dropped the link before. Um, so you feel like we scroll up in the chat um, to find the link too. And yeah, it was really great to hear about all of y'all's diverse backgrounds. This is show that a lot of our buddies and design buddies come from something completely different. And I feel like oftentimes you might feel like you're behind, but a lot of people kind of find their way to UX in different paths as well. So you're just right on time. And with that, we're gonna jump to our first question, which is, we just related actually. How how do you craft your narrative in your resume, portfolio, and LinkedIn to explain your career ship to UX design? And if you have a lack of UX specific experience, basically, how do you leverage your background? That's like your non UX background to um, get a UX job. And we're gonna go with Jasmine. All right. So I think the first thing when I was in that time period, I had to like really convince myself that I am a designer. And I think that's the first thing that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm a designer. What? But you are. So say that you are. You're not an aspiring designer. You are a designer or researcher. Um, but when you're talking about your resume, what what can you do to help convey your new story? I think it's really about that top the top section where you say you're about me, um, it's like you, some people try to hide like, oh, I, I used to be this, but no, you should, you should leverage the fact that you have a completely different um, career before. Or you should leverage your background if it's completely different from um, design. And there's a really good talk, I'll put it in the chat, but he really explains how you can explain um, in a in a way that helps people get curious about who you are and want to ask you questions about like okay 
I want to um, learn more about you. Because remember that that resume, those portfolios, that quick statement is just to get people to be curious. And once you get people curious enough to ask, like they want to ask you a question, then all of a sudden it switches. So you're not taking their time, but now they're taking yours because now they're curious and they want to learn more about you. So I think really emphasizing on how you pitch yourself um, will really help you as you in your job search. Yeah, definitely press along on that. And if you like having a different background, this is a great way to stand out as well. Um, I'm sure that's like a common question that people kind of ask is when they're, because I feel like, at least from what I can see, I feel like there's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of people out there looking for jobs and standing out with your own unique story is a great way too. Um, we're going to go with our next question, um, which is, what are the most important, let's get right into it. I'm sure this is what a lot of y'all are wondering, um, which is what are the most important things UX recruiters or hiring managers look for? Like your resume, your years of experience, your certifications, your portfolio, or like what rings the most? Cause I know it can be kind of um, sound like a lot intimidating for those just starting a job, their job search. And I guess like if you were to prioritize something and really focus on um, on some of those things, what do y'all think is most important? And we'll start with Andreas first. Um, so at least for me, I do think that the most important thing when it comes to getting your foot in UX would be your portfolio, because a lot of the times, if you don't have a lot of experience, that's where you're able to display um, your expertise and what you can do and you, what you can actually do. So for designers, what uh, how you're what your thought process is, what, uh, and also it's a it's a way for you to display your skills. Uh, same thing for research. Uh, when it comes to UX research, your reports are you are your portfolio and the things that you deliver. So that so having something that is is tangible that you can show and display uh, not only your thought process but you, but when it comes to research, your your analysis skill and also your your writing skills. That is something that I would say like it's the thing that that people look out for the most and even the in, even to this point when i was interviewing for jobs i i got a very high response when it comes to like a very specific project that i have and that one just like straight straight forward me to the to basically having everything and going to next steps with that company so yeah, for me, it would be like, if you're going to focus on one thing, just focus on your portfolio. Awesome. Thank you. I also heard very similar about design. Um, but yeah, let's do Chris next. Yeah. So the, there's lots of ways in which to communicate skills, but the recruiters and anyone who's hiring someone, they want to know how you think. So this, there's no right way in which to do that, but there's lots of ways. There's, you see case studies all over the place. It's like, all of that is about process. And if you can communicate that you know the design process well, that's what we want to hire for. Like we want to be able to pull somebody in who we don't have to train from ground up that you kind of know the, the baseline and then that you can do that, right? But there's this premise that I see a lot of like, it has to be perfect. I'm like, no, there's no perfect in design. So show the error, show where you where you made a thinking and then you change that thinking, it, whether it was from a user that gave you feedback that, that shifted that or whether you were um, made an assumption and it was wrong. All those things are essentially um, foundational in that output. And at portfolios that you can see that they are a record of your work, but they are a record of what you are currently doing. And there's no like, we, you have to work on them for the rest of your career. You, you show the things that you are really proud of that you can speak to. Um, it's because when you sit in an interview or somebody calls you, like they, the, the reality of it is, is that a recruiter or a hiring manager, they're going to, they're not going to spend, they're not going to parse through your whole background. They're going to look at your resume pretty quickly. They're going to look at a few things on your, on your, uh, your portfolio, as long as they align to the skills. So that's where just being specific. What was your role? What, how much time did it take to do that thing? What skills did you actually use in that? And how did, and how did it actually result in an outcome, right? That, that I think a lot of things that get left off of case studies is like, what was the results? You made a thing, so what, right? Like show what, you, what it resulted in, right? Did it improve sales? Did, it, did your user get happier? Whatever that is, like it has to have a business result. If it misses, if it's missing that, a lot of times people will be like, well, 
that per we're gonna have to show that person how to come up with results. So they're they're not they're missing a complete component of what that means to be a designer. So yeah, definitely plus one. I feel like portfolio is a great way to like showcase your thinking, but there's also definitely other ways too. Um, yeah, we're gonna go with Jasmine next. Oh wait, can I piggyback off of that actually? Yeah. Yeah, Chris, that's a really good point about like you know, really explaining your process and portfolios. And I always look for that. But also, I think we can be strategic on how we present that information. Like you don't want to just dump it all in your portfolio, right? So a really good way to, um, like, I want to see as a hiring manager, I want to see, like, can you understand how much information you should be giving and how much you should be holding back. And so some people, they have their portfolio as like that teaser, right? Like it's giving me just enough information. And then they do like a read more and they link it to medium and medium is where you can just word vomit, like all your process and get into the real nitty gritty. Um, and so that's one way you can be strategic about it. Yeah, I love that. And oftentimes people always wonder like, how do I like emphasize all my thinking, but have it like shorter enough for how you might just to scan through. So I love that, like having a medium article where you can elaborate it all um, if people are interested. And, and this kind of leads us to our next question, which is, um, what is the best way to stand out about hiring managers and recruiters? And really, Jasmine, I know you mentioned how you came from like teaching science. So I'd love to, about, to hear also about how you leveraged your background to stand out to recruiters. Totally. It's all about how you present yourself. And I can say that because the first, my first UX job, um, I applied to, it was a senior design role. And there's no way I was a senior designer, right? But how I did that was, how I contacted the hiring manager. And I think, you know, there's so many people, especially right now in this great resignation where everyone is just switching careers. And you know that, that button on LinkedIn where it's like, click here to apply. How easy is that? How many people do you think click that button? So, you know, like, do you expect to get a response? I don't know. There's like, you're one out of a bajillion. So the key is you really need to get human eyes on your resume, on your portfolio, and how you do that, there's a lot of strategies. And I'll put in the chat like an article that goes really well with this is you need to find who the hiring manager is. You need to reach out to them, find their email, reach out to them, and like explain why you are, why you're, why you're a good person for the role. And you also think about like, don't come in the way that's like, oh, I would love to provide this for you. I can do this. No, 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 no. Like you need to put it in the other way of like, here's what I can do for you because I am valuable. I have the skills and don't be like cocky about it, but you know, like you need to present yourself and communicate your value. So find out what your value it is and then figure out how to communicate it well. Yeah, definitely plus one. Just coming off is like, oh, I want to help you so bad, but the peer person's like, but what qualifications do you have? And for you, by showcasing your skills, it really highlights that for them. Um, yeah, so I'm going to jump around and take some listener questions. Um, I just listed all the questions that you have all submitted in the chat. So we're going to do our first upvoted questions. I guess kind of y'all already touched on kind of core soft skills. I know I actually don't really like the term soft skills. I think they're not soft at all. Like I think they're just as essential. Um, anyways, it's just a, like kind of a side I have, but, um, but Anonymous asked, I'd love to hear about core soft skills, whether like communication, storytelling, um, and anyone can go first. Um, sure. I mean, as a UX researcher, you need to have, like you mentioned, communication skills, but also you need to be able to develop trust with your, uh, with your stakeholders, basically because, how do I put this? As a UX researcher, it's your job to tell someone that their baby's ugly and that they have to, fi and that they have to fix that ugly baby. So if you don't have trust with your, with your stakeholders, or if they don't believe, or if they don't trust your, yeah, basically if they don't trust your expertise, uh, how are, how are they going to, how are, why would they even listen to you uh, to begin with? And not only that, but you also need to be able to, to have communication, to uh, communication skills, as well as being able to display your, uh, your point effectively, because it doesn't matter if you have the best research in the world, if no one reads it and no one understands it, it doesn't matter. So I feel like communication and communication um, is very important, even though 
it sounds like super generic, but in the, but in terms of research, those are very good examples of when would it, when would it be useful to have it, and also why is that important. Yeah, I definitely agree on that. Oh, Chris, yeah, you want to go? Grace, I, 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 Andreas, I totally agree with you. The, like what the what you're communicating, like why is it important? And ha the the problem is sometimes portfolios is it, it's hard to show the whole thing, but you want to show the the nuggets, like the ins, like what was the insight that drove that, and and how did that, how was that shareable, right? Research in particular is one of those things, like how well was this received by the, whoever you shared it with? Like we worked on it with a small team and we shared it with designers and then it resulted in this outcome, right? But I think one of the things, Grace, you even mentioned is that like soft skills, there is no such thing as soft skill. Like the, the actually, I think some of the things that get designers, UX designers in particular, some of their roles is their ability to, to lean on all of those soft skills, public speaking, talking with strangers, Working with with users, like all those things are really hard. And to do that well takes a level of trust. And if you can get trust from your users, you can get insights from them. Those insights can then drive radical, really meaningful change inside of each of your outputs. But if you can't talk about that, if you can't show that you can do that, like nobody trusts you to do that. And sometimes there is a lot in the UX role in particular, there's lots of autonomy. If you don't have a lot of autonomy as a UX designer, you're working at the wrong location. <laughs> like there's, if someone's pushing down on you, the role is to go out and find problems, right? To work with users intimately so that the business doesn't just say do X. You're like, no, let's validate why that's important. And let's show that that actually can result in the outcome. That is not an easy job. <laughs> and to do that well, you have to show that you're able or capable of those things. That's where like, I, I can do that. It's so hard on a resume to list those things out because most recruiters or efforts are looking for things like, can you work with Adobe or Figma or whatever? Like, can you use X tool or X thing? Yes, those things are valuable, but aligning them inside of how you, I think writing is one of the biggest underestimates like in, in most of design. But like that's where a really well-crafted case study shows that you can write about an idea and think, right? Writing is thinking and therefore doing that well is, is extending that. So um, I, I don't know, we use language all the time. I think the words we use are really important and soft. It, none of them are soft skills. <laughs> so um, I agree on that. Yeah, I definitely agree on that too, writing and communicating. Um, yeah, Dawson, did you also want to add anything as well? Yeah. Um... You know, there's always in the interview process, there's like that design challenge, whether it's a take home thing or it's like an exercise and activity. And, you know, on the surface, it's judging your process. But a lot of times that panel is really thinking about how does this person respond to feedback? Do they take it? Do they just ignore it? Do they move on? Right. Those are soft skills there. Or what if we throw a curveball? How well is this person at adapting and being flexible? And so that's just something to keep in mind, like all, on the surface, it might be they're testing for hard skills, but they're always looking. We're always looking to see, you know, do I even just want to work with you as a person? Like, will I enjoy working with you at the end of the day? Are you a human that I want to be around? So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, I like to echo what Flora said in the chat, we call it human skills. So yeah, they're not soft. I feel like they're just as important and we can just call them human skills. It's sort of moving. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I we're going to do a lightning round towards the end as well to get through as many questions as possible. But I'm going to link some common questions that I've seen throughout the chat on Slido and also submitted into one question. There's always that whole like chicken and egg scenario where it's like you can't get a job with no experience, but you need experience to get a job. And so what is kind of your advice? And the question is, what would you suggest people interested in UX do to get started to secure their first job when a lot of job descriptions require three to five years of experience? And anyone can chime in on this. I mean, I would say volunteer, do projects on your own. Just because you don't have a job doesn't mean that you cannot do a project by yourself. Coming from video games, something that I used to do a lot was... Oh, this game is out. I can do UX research, UX research on it. I mean, it's already out, so I can do literally whatever I want with it. And until uh, and that's something that is super common. A lot of people get their first job from, like, for example, level designers. 
uh, because they modded le- they modded games. So that is a valid career path. So I would just say like, if you don't have any experience as in, within a, like a particular job, just start doing things and that would become the experience that you can later showcase on things like your portfolio and your resume. Definitely plus a thousand with that. Oh, Jasmine, I saw you on here. Oh yeah. Um, I'm putting in the chat, like a list of places where you can get pro bono projects. Um, and they're always fun, but let's, like Andres said, um, writing a case study is really, really helpful. So when I first did my boot camp, one of our projects was like this capstone project and you could find it on my medium. I basically did usability testing on Uber Eats. And I was like, I don't know why I picked that up, but it was very strategic later when I was interviewing that when I was looking at some companies that were in that similar type of space, when I applied, I would like put in my cover letter, a link to that case study and be like, oh, I've been thinking about this a lot link, you know? So, and then people see like, oh, okay, she knows what she's talking about, even though she doesn't have that experience, like I can see how her thought process is. And so doing case studies on any type of app and just pointing out things you observe or things, how you can improve it, how could it benefit the business can make you really um, stand out. Definitely plus one on that. I did one on Discord and that helped me. Mm-hmm. I actually presented that at my internship interview with EA and got the job. So I, I, I plus one with Jadon's advice. Um, Chris, did you also have anything to add to this question? Um, yeah, so you're, if you're really committed to doing UX for your career, it's a long, long, it's a journey, right? It's a path. So like, don't allow like not having a project to keep you from doing that. Like, if you're curious, you want to follow through like that, that don't stop. Like a lot of people will do classes or take, like they need that prompt to do that. But like having, thinking about problems in a way that allows you to continue to grow your skill, continue to be related to that only extends that. Networking is another one is like take experiments, talk with people. I know um, all of us came from ADP list. Go go look and talk with other designers who may then have things that are like, oh, that's there's a huge problem that we're dealing with now that we didn't have before. I mean, we joined a pandemic and we're all here. Like this, the world is very, changes really fast. And your ability to do that means to do that. I mean, I would say like read a ton of books. I, I've read the book myself, but like there's this stuff that I don't think ever stops. Like writing on Medium, like sharing about the world that you know, like it, it's a well that doesn't run dry. If you're worried it does, I would kind of say get out of the design profession because you're gonna, it's going to eat you alive if you don't have a well that doesn't, that, that isn't endless. Um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's to be a negative person about that but like it's this world is hard you don't want you don't want to just like dip your toe in like I say this with students I teach I'm like cannonball in that's what you got to do if you're not willing to cannonball in it's going to make you're going to have a really hard time because people hiring managers other designers we feel that hesitancy and if you don't want to be that person who like just dives in on a problem it's really hard to be like oh yeah let's hire that person they're gonna we're gonna have to drag them along like no that's not who gets hired it's like oh that person we're gonna throw any anything at and they're gonna like jump for joy and like go go like help solve the problem or figure out what what to do or how that works or what that is is, is, is meaning so um yeah then jasmine i see you like can I add? That's so true. Like your mental state really makes a difference and applying and making this transition is a big effort. And so I would say like, yeah, that added, like, you know, a lot of times you can be working on the stuff like case studies to build up yourself. You can find pro bono projects. Um, you could also, when you're networking, right? Like before you have that stench of, I need a job, just talk to people and just be fun. And then people remember your personality. And later when they are hiring, then they'll be like, oh, I, I remember that person. Maybe that person's now ready. Um, also, if you can't get that experience, like finding these pro bono projects or real clients to work with is, is challenging because you know, it, it is hard. So a lot of people try to, um, you know, your resume, there's some things that you can do. Like if you were a career switcher like me, you have to think about like, how do those skills or those things you did in your last role, how do they apply? And so how can you change those words so that they make sense? Because let's first say, for example, you used to be a, 
I don't know, a butcher, or you used to be a, a, um, a PM, right? How can you phrase the things that you did? Because I don't know that industry, whatever you did before. How do you phrase them into like design lingo? Because in your old job, you probably developed, prioritized, and presented strategy to someone. We call those people key stakeholders, right? Or you probably conducted user research. You probably looked at other products. Maybe you were in retail and you did competitive research. I don't know. Like you have to think about how can you reframe things so that it fits the the design world, right? And show all those other things. Like how have you taken initiative of processes? You know, you've probably done that. Like I did that when I was working in a restaurant. I improved the processes of organizing wine. You know, like. So on your resume, if you can't get those skills, like those experiences, you can still adjust your existing experience, just give it a new lens so that it helps you appear more designery or researchy. Yeah, I love that. It's like applying processes, especially for those coming from like engineering. I talk about how I balance like biological systems and like systems thinking. So there's always things you can pull from other things, even if you might think like they're not related, they actually, they, you can find some stuff are. And I feel like you definitely have to have a thick skin when it comes to design because almost everyone in the world has an opinion on design and you got to be there to <laughs> kind of like elaborate on that as well and respond to their feedback and opinions, even if you're the specialist in the room. So yeah. Um, I saw some discussion about regarding like NDA projects, how to show them. And I'm going to kind of integrate this with another question that was submitted is um, for we're going to do a design UX design and then we're going to follow up with a UX research question. Or this can also be for UX research as well is what are some red flags that you've seen on portfolios during the interview? And maybe those red flags and also talk a bit about what if like a time when you, you probably saw someone did like an NDA project. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Chris. Um, <clears throat> this one's a little harder, but um, things that I, that I, I, in teaching students that I see a lot of problems is uh, that, especially if it's group related work, like you not being explicit about what your role was and trying to pass off deliverables or assets that a group did or someone else on the team did as your own. So um, it, yes, it was all in the, in the, in this process of, completing that, but I've like been in interviews where I'm like, oh, this is a really great, uh, you know, illustration of the album. They're like, oh, I didn't make that. They're like, oh, well, that's why I'm talking to you, <laughs> right? Like, oh, bummer. Oh, oh, well, bummer. Like uh, that was the reason we were here, right? Like, and some of that could be as explicit as like, you know, listing who, who worked on that or being explicit. Like I'm always harping on like, no image in your portfolio should show up without a title, without some context, without like little, like even, metadata that shows up on the image that you can kind of um, kind of equate ownership to. Um, but those things, especially when you're early, like you're trying to really show, highlight the things that you have done. And if you're done inside of a group project, be explicit about how you participated in that collaboration. All of design, all of UX is collaborative. Um, and I think a lot of times the big flags are showing like, it's me, 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 me. And you're like, I don't want to work with that person. They're never going to listen to another idea. Like they didn't show anything else that the team did. They didn't show how ideas came together. Like all that stuff is just about them. So um, it depends on what you're trying to highlight. But yeah, that, those are typically big flags for me when you are working with you with younger designers. Yeah, taking credit for something that's on its own, like plagiarism is like huge in the design industry. I witnessed it like three times on my own portfolio in one month. So it is quite common and you should try to always just claim your work. And um, yeah, it's it's a real thing that also hiring managers are also kind of like really looking out for as well. Um, yeah, and I guess I was, I'm going to separate the NDA question, actually. Um, we're going to go back to the question about the red flags you see on portfolio. So um, we go with Jasmine next. Oh man, I think Chris kind of took my answer, but <laughs> yeah, it's like, actually, here's another one. Um, during the interview process, if someone asks like, this is a hard question, but if someone asks, um, what's a, a piece of like harsh feedback or bad feedback or constructive criticism that you've received recently? And if you don't have an answer, do you know what that says about you? That you're not actively looking to learn and grow. <laughs> so make sure you have an answer to that because it could bite you in the butt. 
That's a great question for an interview. Uh, it's, a scary <laughs> one. it's a scary <laughs> one, but I think because you have to have an answer where like, you know, it shows that you're vulnerable. It shows that you're actively learning and that's okay to be transparent about your flaws. The key is what are you doing about it? Right. What have you done to work on that? What are you doing? How are you getting help? So it's okay to be transparent. I think people appreciate it, especially in these days. Yeah, a lot of self-awareness is such an important skill for both design research and like basically everywhere. Um, yeah, I guess Paige asked, can you give a quick example about how to answer a time when you responded to like hard feedback or a time where things didn't go well? I guess I kind of put everyone on the spot, but <laughs> in case anyone had an answer, otherwise you can skip over. I mean, I used to have a, a default one when I was first starting to interview, because I'm not a native English speaker, I had a really thick accent. Um, so accent and also depending on where someone is from, um, I have certain difficulties understanding them. So, and this sucks for me because I live in Florida, but the really Southern accent, like, like, the, like the Georgia, and I'm not talking about like the Southern Bell type of thing, but like deep country. I cannot for the life of me understand it. And I had a teacher that spoke like that. And it took me two weeks to understand what he was saying. So being a, so me, I was very upfront with telling them like, oh, something that it was really difficult to, uh, that was really difficult for me was to do certain types of, of moderated studies, especially usability studies, just because certain accents I cannot understand very well. And I'm working on it by familiarizing by familiarizing myself a little bit more with the dif with the different aspects of of English, and it's something that it is really easy to overlook, just because people that are native uh, native speakers take for granted. Yeah, I feel like that's an interesting question as well, and I feel like there's always different areas and demographics to consider. Um, yeah, I'm, we have like 20 minutes left. So I'm going to try to, we're going to do a lightning round at the last 10 minutes. So that's when we try to breeze through as many as we can. Um, okay, so a nice question asked by James um, from the live event is, how has research, UX research, for example, interviewing changed as remote work has become more commonplace for Andreas? Um, it has basically changed a, a, a little bit in terms of like what methodologies and what tools can you use? but it has changed a lot in terms of like distribution and things of that nature. So when I was working with video games, it was, oh, how can we safely de deliver a build and make sure that they that it doesn't get any, any leaks? So it, it's mainly through security. Things that have changed because we don't have that control. And also when you're moderating a test, knowing that you're also in part, in part tech support, just because you have to, you have to see what questions happen what things arise and being able to solve it, not just from like a methodological standpoint, but also like, oh, oh crap, this broke. What do I do now? So that is also a part of like how it changed because now, uh, because before we knew each computer, we uh, we I knew what computer have uh, what our computers have. We were able to to test the, the build in our own machines before beforehand, but now we just we were just sending a build and hoping for the best. So that's uh, methodologically, I, I don't think that it has changed too much, but it's on those day-to-day -day tasks that has changed the most. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go another question that was submitted and then I'm gonna tackle the ageism question after that one. So um, this one user, user research centered is, uh, what methods, tools, experiences, and or frameworks do you consider absolutely necessary for entry level UX researchers to enter the field already proficient and so they prepare to succeed in the role? And uh, Chris or Andreas, feel free to take this one too. Um, I mean, there's a lot, but I mean, there's a foundation in human centered design um, and like understand it. Then there's qualitative and quantitative methods. <laughs> I, I mean, the list can go on and on, but user testing, can they prototype? Can you, uh, can you align, can you validate ideas? Um, can you do um, 
need finding. Uh, I think there's a, the list goes on and on. Most of that process is around, depending on where you work, then it's like, are you familiar with agile development processes? Can you work with developers inside of a two week cycle? Do you know how to process and create user stories? Like all those things are specific skills, but if they, if you fundamentally don't understand like why a designer goes through the cycle, um, doing any one of those skills kind of misses the boat because very few designers, no matter where you work, you rarely get to start at the at like zero. There's nothing built, I'm not, like nothing is in the air. We get to start with just research. Um, that's rare. A lot of times you're joining a group that like has already worked on stuff and they're like, we need someone who can help us with uh, research. We need you to help us with prototyping or we need you to help us with the, pr the prototyping and testing cycle. Like all those things, if you can't show how you can jump into that space. Um, and a lot of times what is hard is um, some frameworks change, tools change all the time, but what doesn't change is like a, an ethos of why you care about your user and relate the outcome to the business. Um, that is never going to change for how, no matter what we're building. Um, if you can do that well, then you can get CEOs and clients, whatever, customers all to kind of convince or, lean, or put the user as their, as your kind of primary source. Um, and that's the role of, of UX as a whole. So um, yeah, kind of hard to, to say that there's like, got to know it all. It's like, well, you kind of have to dabble in a lot and then you have to dial up what you really want to go do if you love talking with users and you love doing the front end of research like show that in your skill set if you really love the prototyping and interaction stuff like show that right if you love the ui great like it all has relationships there so i think um but if you don't know the whole cycle it's really hard to kind of step into a team or run bigger things or work with larger teams too and that, that stuff all moves into a strategy space. Uh, they're actually, uh, I don't know, Grace, they're, we'll be sharing a, um, a two by two matrix of the kind of the roles uh, that play inside of UX and there's tons of them. So, and they are always growing. So I, I, I wouldn't like, you have to be a UX designer. Like there's, there's these roles change all the time. And 10 years ago, like none of them existed. So like, that's kind of the other thing that's kind of funny about this industry. Um. I mean, I think for UX research, you just basically know what qualitative, quantitative is, and have a little bit of and have a little bit of knowledge of when would we be appropriate to uh, when would be like good to use what. Uh, aside from that, uh, anything else is a plus. Like familiarity with certain research methods, it's okay, and also you can learn a lot about different things on the on the role itself. It's not like um, it's not like if you're a junior UX, uh, UX researcher, I'm going to have you do like a whole qualitative, a uh, whole qualitative, uh, un um, unscripted, like free flow, um, cog cognitive walkthrough of what, of what it is. And also just don't be afraid of telling people you don't know something. I'm the first one that I don't know. I don't remember the names of things. So a lot of the times where I'm speaking with with other researchers, I have like a go I have Google open because because I'm like I know I've heard this before. I don't know if I've done it. In nine times out of ten, I either I either have done it and I completely forgot the name of what the thing was called, or I just or it's like oh yeah I read about this but I haven't done it yet. So I would say like from a research standpoint, like I mean straightforward. You need to know how to write. That's like main thing is like main thing for for everyone is like uh, for every single ux discipline i feel but in terms of like what do you have to know not a lot it's just mainly being familiar with some basic with like some base concepts of oh i do i know what qualitative research is i know what quantitative research is i know when it's appropriate to use when the right time for using qualitative versus quantitative is I know what mix. I know what mixed methods means in terms of like research. Do I know how to do all, all of those? Not necessarily, but I know what they are. And just having that baseline, it's very. It's like something that it would be really good and really helpful for when you're just starting. Yeah, definitely. Plus, one. I don't need to know everything, but you need to know how to Google really well as well. And 
um, being able to apply different methods, different situations. So we're really gonna go with the ageism question and then we'll go over Chris's two by two matrix of the jobs and then we'll do a lightning round and then we'll do a group photo. So a big question that was also submitted um, in Luma and also in the chat is, have you witnessed accounts of ageism and UX hiring? If so, what tips would you give to someone that might be facing that? And I'll go with Jasmine. Yeah, I I have worked with people who are older and they have voiced to me that they they worry about that sometimes. And I think, you know, I mean, I think it's like when I'm when I'm hiring, I'm thinking about like, do I want to work with this person? Like what value do they provide? And like it's kind of that thing like your your vibe attracts your tribe, right? So if I see that this person is um like active in the community and posting on Twitter and like, just like really engage, then like I, you know, age doesn't mean anything to me. So um, yeah, I, 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 I hear it's a concern from people, but I haven't experienced it myself. I feel like for me, like reverse ages. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I would, oh, yeah, true. Are so <laughs> okay, true. Yeah. yeah. Take that back. Um, yeah, on your resume, I feel like before, like I was taught, like put the age, put your year of your high school graduate. Don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't need to know. <laughs> Irrelevant. So yeah, I guess that part's true. Yeah. Yeah. And the people ask, people used to ask me my age during interviews. I'm just like, I ask, why do you want to know? And so if people like ask you my age, ask, why do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> <Ask> the <them> best. <laughs> So yeah, all right, Chris, um, let's go over your two by two matrix. I can also share the Figma file with everyone in the email as well. Oh, you're Did, did you want me to share my screen with us? I guess I could do that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let me share my screen real quick. This is a, uh, a quick little thing um, I put together just to talk about some of the roles in UX. Um, here, let me share. Do, do, do. Um, this is a, a community Figma file. Um, and I guess we can just open this. Or I can go back to Figma. Sorry, I, I didn't know we were going to be opening this, but it's fine. Um, let me just open Figma. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry. You guys are all seeing the, the, back, the backdrop. <clears throat> so uh, essentially, um, this. Figma file. I get rid of this thing. Uh, is aligning. There's essentially, I don't know, ten or fifteen roles, uh, and this is a two by two matrix, which some of you may see. I don't get rid of this for right now. Um, there we go. Uh, the, the two by two matrix is essentially set up a, a, along a spectrum of like, is it non-technical? Like, do I have to know computer science versus highly technical? Like I probably have to have a computer science degree or some knowledge in, in coding and, and, and front end and back end. And then the strategy versus kind of execution. Again, the, there's a lot of arguments that these bubbles move around a lot, um, but essentially like there's some, some space of like, product designers typically live kind of in the middle uh, UX engineers, obviously, yeah, like come from the world of, of coding, uh, solution architects, uh, software solution architects, very strategic in their space, um, align up here. You'll see some of these roles that aren't maybe typically under UX, but like if you are designing software and you are doing that at a high level, like you either are working directly with UX people or you have to have a lot of overlap in your knowledge space. Um, things like content strategists, you know, there's, I think this is an argument that customer experience goes over the whole top of this thing, but there, whatever, we don't need to argue how the, how big the bubbles are um, necessarily, but the, a lot of these roles are things like content strategist, consumer, uh, customer experience, design researcher, content strategist, information architect, interaction designer, product designer, software solution architect, user experience designer, UX engineer, UX writer, which is becoming more, um, more common these days, user interface designer, visual designer, and web designer. Now, all of these at, at one time were always just known as like webmaster <laughs> or as like uh, information architect or like some other role that was inside the space. Now, a lot of them have skewed or been separated out. 
and even UX kind of encompass and can maybe even come encompass all of them. Like I am a UX designer, but I happen to be doing things in the research space, or I really am doing a lot of stuff in the web space. Like so now I'm doing web design. Like how you're applying those things aligns to that, but knowing where how they kind of can move around is really helpful in kind of dialing up or saying, I really am interested in doing more systems, structure logic components okay well maybe look for roles that are more in the information architecture space and then you're going to be doing site maps and uh navigation components and uh logic of how information is outlined and laid out um so this might be helpful in in, in aligning that again this is a community file that uh, i kind of put up for you all to share um and these roles are also changing three years ago nobody called the ux designer a product designer i actually know a lot of physical product designers that are all annoyed that the the UX and product space is is usurping that title because they're like no you guys don't make a physical product <laughs> you're you're calling your thing a product but like I'm the one who makes like the actual phone and I'm a product designer like so there's a space at which like this stuff is always going to change and shift knowing where the new titles come in knowing how that stuff operates and roles allows you to then kind of speak to these experiences and where you're interested in aligning to and, and a lot of times i may come in through uh visual design and then like skew like i know i i was at a background in graphic design but i i was always interested in systems and i took like a program i took a c plus plus programming class in undergrad college and my the, it was the only class i had to drop out of school and the, the instructor was like you shouldn't do this and i'm like but i'm curious she's like this is a weeder class for engineers. Like, get out. <laughs> like, you're an artist. Like, go away. And I was so frustrated by that that I just like ended up learning a lot of it on whatever. I equate my like background in some web stuff to like MySpace, like messing with my MySpace page. And my generation of the designers, it's like I can't. So many of them were just curious and built stuff that way. So the role here, obviously, is knowing what this space exists, it's always kind of moving and shaking around, but the, and there may be a new bubble that pops up at any one point. Um, and that is a, a relative ability to say, well, where are these roles aligning, right? Why are, why are we seeing more product designers pop up? Why are we seeing less interaction designers pop up? And those may be equated to specific types of skills that you can align and, and equate into your portfolio. Awesome. Thanks so much. This is so interesting. There's like so many different roles and all these names and everything changes and like next three years might be something completely different. Cool. So we have yeah, about or, five Or they'll all collapse left. on themselves and we'll just start calling each other's designers again. That'll, that'll yeah. Be yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Always be open-minded and learning. That's another soft skill. Um, yeah. We so um, we can, we can, if we can start, stop sharing your screen, we can do a quick mm -hmm. lightning round of questions. Um, just the pulse check on the host. Are you okay to stay a tiny bit over time to answer as many questions as you can? Okay, cool. So our next question is, what is the best way to prepare for UX design and research interviews? And anyone can go first. I'll go. <laughs> One thing I like to do is I look at the job description and I, I'm very old school, paper and pencils and highlighter. I take my highlighter out and I get all the colors and I like look at, okay, what, what does this job description, what do they want? Can I boil it down to like five things? Okay, they want someone who can communicate, who can collaborate, who can, what are those things? And then I look at all, I basically have like a, like a full long resume. It's like my lifetime resume. And it's really good to start doing this now because who knows, maybe later you're going to switch careers later and you're like, what did I do in that one job? So keep this lifelong resume. And so then I look at the things I highlighted, the categories, and I take that lifelong resume and I like copy and paste them over like okay what are the skills that tie to the skill that they're looking for and then how do i frame those into stories that are very concise and that i could easily say like okay tell me about a time when you had to make a hard decision and then i'm like okay they're thinking of this question here's my answer boom like the key i think to being a good interviewee is having your stories ready because like when you're like oh i don't know hmm you know, like that's taking up their time. But if you can come up like, wow, this girl's really prepared. She has her story. She knows her values. She knows what she's good at. Like take that time to really think about what are you bringing to the table and what are the experiences that act as evidence to show that. Yeah, so I love it. Lifelong resume, everyone. Go start yeah. yours today. And interviewing <laughs> is a skill. you got to practice it. 
like if you're if you're nervous you're like that's because like it's like public speaking you don't just go up and do it you like some can pull it off but like you gotta you gotta have it you gotta know what you're kind of ready for and if you have somebody you can lean on to do like do a mock interview or like you have another friend designer like interview each other to see how it goes like all of it is there as which a way it's just like and again, I think Jasmine makes a really good point. Like, you got to have short, concise, you get a half an hour to impress people. I've been on interviews where there's like group interviews. Those are the, by the way, those are the worst. But like academia loves them. And you're just like, I don't know. Did I impress eight people at once? I have no idea. I had a half hour. Like, I don't know. And then you would, but like, you just try and tell the stories that what you know, and you, you got to have them locked. Because if you're not, and you hum and haw, or you don't know where to go. It just, it wastes time. Or they just like, but th th there's very few reasons for people skip in that scenario. So. Also it's like, just go to parties, just talk to people because the more you can just tell, like tell people your story <laughs> and you're not going to see these people again. So just practice talking to strangers because that will help you in your interviews for sure. <laughs> go to parties. Go to conferences, I guess, and talk to strangers <laughs> and maybe parties, actually, because those people have less likely sticks in your life. Conferences, you might meet your future boss. So True. Um. <laughs> also, if you, one thing, too, I like to do is like I like to go on Medium and Twitter and just like see what's trending. Go on Reddit and like, find out what's trending, because if you are interviewing and you can teach your inner your panel something you learn, one, you're giving them the impression that, wow, this person is constantly learning and I can learn. If they're already teaching me something in the interview process, like I'm going to be learning from them as I work with them. And, you know, it's just teach them something. So do that. Yeah, I love that. That's a life hack I never heard of before. But go over your trends and teach your interviewer things. I love that. Um, yeah, we're going to do a quick group photo, actually, before everyone has to hop off. And then we'll do a quick round of um, lightning round to get through as many questions as we can that are upvoted. So um, I'll give everyone a few seconds to turn on your camera. We're going to do a photo in a way for Instagram story. Um, yeah, if you don't want to, feel free to like not turn your camera. Um, if you don't want to turn your camera, but you still want to be in the group photo, feel free to react. Um, it will appear in the photo as well. That's what I saw some people doing. I'm going to count down 10 seconds. And after a group photo, we're going to probably stay like five to 10 minutes, um, if that's okay with everyone, um, to answer like lightning round questions, just so we get all of our buddies and amazing designers questions answered. And uh, Shanna also dropped our networking sheet. Definitely connect with your fellow buddies. Um, make friends, send them personalized LinkedIn requests saying, and, and also connect with our speakers. All of our speakers' details are in the chat as well. Um, send them a, a personalized invite saying that y'all met each other at this event. So it's like meeting in real life, but meeting in a virtual space. So we're gonna do a static one first and then a way for our Instagram stories. So um, I'm going to count down five seconds and I'm going, feel free to like grab any object you want as well. I have Fluffle here with me. Fumble's our friendly bunny mascot. Um, and then I'll take a couple photos and choose the one where everybody looks the best in. <laughs> so it's like a, a wholesome, friendly family photo, right? All right. Ready, set. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Say fluffle. Fluffle. <laughs> All right. We're going to do a wave for our Instagram story. So, oh, I just got pinged on Slack. Ah, that's my life. Um, yeah, okay, I'm just making sure I'm logging to the right account. All right, ready, set, wave. Hello, buddies. We are at Key UX Roles and Soft Skills with our buddies at ADQ List. And thank you to our amazing panelists, Jasmine, Chris, and Andres. Andres for giving your wonderful advice today. Make sure you check out the recording on YouTube. All right, this is gonna go on our Instagram, at design.buddies. We always do this to spice things up. Um, and unfortunately, we won't be able to take any live questions just because we have so many, but submit your questions on Slido, we get through as many. So um, my next question is, do recruiters need a portfolio for a senior or managerial UX position? Um, I'm, I'm one of those, like, I think everyone should have a portfolio though. The reality of it is, is that as you get to higher ups, like the, the, the 
title and where you've worked speaks for itself and you don't have to do that. So I know a lot of senior people who just don't have, they don't have time or they're just not actually actively putting a face forward facing portfolio, but I guarantee in those interviews, they're showing work, talking about what they do, even for man, I, I always kind of even think like project managers and PMs should have portfolios as well. Like, here's how I handled an email or here's how, here's how teams, whatever. There's all this stuff that you can, you got to show what you know how to do. So, um, but bigger, as you get higher up, higher recruiters get involved and then you just, it's more about conversations than it is about physically having your work present on a web page or any of that other stuff. So. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna speed through the rest. Um, another uploaded one was, when you only have school under your belt, should you limit that you only apply to junior positions or apply to mid-level positions as well? I would say uh, go to junior just because for mid-level positions, they usually, uh, that's when the years of experience are more like are more likely to be a detriment against you. So for, uh, at least for research mid-level, you start being considered mid-level depending on the company, starting at three years of experience. So I would say that not only that, not only you, your experience would probably be a little bit more tailored to a junior, but also you will have a lot uh, better chances of getting a call back for a junior position rather than going straight to mid-level. I'm gonna challenge you and say, <laughs> you can, I'd say you can apply, but don't just cold apply. Like I would reach out to a physical person and if you could communicate why you'd be good, because like I said, in my role, I apply for the senior role and I did that multiple times and I let them decide if I'm good enough, not me. <laughs> I love that mindset. <laughs> I always try to shoot my shot. And if I don't, if I don't get it, I ask why and learn and iterate. It's like UXing your UX interviewing process, <laughs> UX job process. <laughs> always about learning and optimizing. All right, we're gonna go. Our next question is: How do you talk about the work you've done when you can't show it your work on your portfolio because you got NDAs and confidentiality re um, regulations? Um. So. Rule of thumb, you can either say what you, uh, what you did, but don't say who you did it for, or you can say who you work with and don't say anything else. So for example, for me, I could say like, oh, I did a little bit of like UX research for certain types of games in this genre for this, for this type of console. What the client was, it. but on the other hand, um, for example, I work on a game called Darksider Genesis. That's it. I'm not saying anything else about that at all. So it's either, so one or the other. And t typically during interview, during an interview, like it, you can share NDA work. Um, you just can't put it publicly on a web page. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of like, or you can hide it behind a password. Um, and that typically is also a way in which you can um, skirt. So it's just about like publicly putting work that you're under an NDA on. Um, also, but like I worked on Theranos, you know, I shared that, I share that work now all the time, but I was NDA'd for a long time on that stuff until like, I, and now I'm not even, whatever. Do you have a to link to that, that you can share about Theranos? <laughs> sure. <laughs> also to add on to that, um, I think a lot of people respect, like if you are under NDA and like you're not complying, then that's like a red flag, right? So like people understand what NDA is and they respect it. A way you could kind of hack it is, like take out the whole product itself. And like people are more interested in the process as opposed to like the product. So like it just like change the industry, like make it something else and kind of just zoom in on one decision part. So you're not revealing like the whole product, you know, people want to see your process. They don't really care. Yeah, also like I don't recommend showing NDA work because it is also a red flag and I would also ask the company that you want to show the work in is that like whether there is any NDA so just like ask because sometimes they have like oh we can't show the numbers but you can show everything else so it, there's different levels of NDA as well you can always just ask and get written requirements and clarification from your other manager. Um, yeah, so for our other questions, let's do like one to two sentences each and not everybody has to answer to all of them uh, if you don't want to. Um, and the uh, other question is, any advice for UI, UX UI designers interning slash working at an early stage startup and are unable to get proper mentorship? Look other way, look in other places. I mean, you don't have to, you don't need a, your mentor to be your coworker. 
you can always get mentorship somewhere else. Thank you. Um, there's also like ADP list design buddy. Mm -hmm. So you're, you don't, you're not limited to your company, just like at school, you're not limited to your classes. You can always learn and same with companies. Um, okay. Another question is how should I approach my employer for a full-time job position as an intern? I guess I can talk briefly about it. Cause I did that like a year ago. Um, I just, well, I just asked like, yeah, <laughs> just, asked. just asked. like, worst thing to say is no. Go ask. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, can I add? Um, yeah. One thing you should do what in your position right now, keep a weekly log, keep a track of every little thing you do, because um, you can look at the job description and you can like kind of make yourself a, like a proposal. So if you have evidence of like, okay, I presented 20 times to these key people, I like keep a record and then that'll be really good evidence and also get feedback from other people. And those quotes can be really helpful, supportive evidence to why you can be a good candidate. Yeah, yeah. awesome. All right, we're going with two more quick questions. Um, how much of the process do you put into the portfolio slide deck when you send in the application versus the portfolio you present in person? Um, I have different projects, but usually it's as much as possible without me getting sued to oblivion. Oh, wait, is he frozen? What? Yeah, oh, I'll usually ask the recruiter or whoever's doing the hiring process, like, what do they want to see? And then you can customize work that you bring. Because, like, there's, if you, you have a lot of work, fine, but if you want, you want to be targeted, it's just, like, what do they want to see? What, like, what have they seen in my portfolio that they want to talk about deeper? Um, that targets the, the, what you can tell stories about, but also allows you to then say, like, oh, okay, they want to see X. Okay, great. I have samples of that for NDA work that's in that space as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, your recruiter is your friend. Um, they probably get commissioned every time they make a successful hire. So ask them as many questions as possible. How to prepare, what resources? That's what I do and it works. So recruiter is friend because they get paid when you get hired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're gonna go with our final question because I know we're at time and I want this last question to be like, is there something you would tell your younger designer self or any other pieces of advice or panelists uh, for everyone that you did, that you want to share um, that didn't get a chance to share yet today? Buckle up, it's gonna be a weird trip. Buckle up, yes, great advice. <laughs> Because you're also been blown away. You got you gotta put your arms, legs inside the car and buckle. <laughs> Is it a roller coaster? Yeah, I mean the only the thing that is constant about UX about UX roles is that they change a lot. So just don't be a, try as much as possible to not be adverse to change because that's the only constant on, on your job. It's like it's gonna be different all the time. Yep. And I don't know, I, I, I sometimes I, I don't mind saying this, but like nobody knows what they're doing. Not really. Like the minute you realize that, then you can go help people. Cause like the problems change. This is what UX is about, right? Like the problems change, things are always different. If you can say, I know, I wanna help you figure that out. Like. They may have been doing that longer, but like I know tons of designers that have been doing this forever. And they're like, am I any good at this? All those users I tested it with yesterday told me no. <laughs> but you, you get up and pick up and you do it again, right? And you know that you can continue doing that. That is the like, just know that it's gonna, I don't know, that you can go help. And if you continue to help, people will see that. And that's worth investing in working with people who want to help you as well. Like don't work for people who don't want to help you. Just they're not, they're not willing to invest in you. If they're not willing to let you grow, there's other places that will. So go, go look for those spaces that let you go. I'd say I have two pieces of advice to my previous self. One, don't compare your, your beginning to someone else's middle. Like you're going to get there eventually and you will, and you're going to rock it. So stay true to that. And then also um, reach out to people like 
I've reached out to a lot of people and I, the, the community is so kind, so generous with their time. And like, don't think of it like, oh, I'm bothering this person. Like, think of it like you're giving them the opportunity to do a kind thing, you know? So that scared me a lot. I'm an introvert. Um, so I feel you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you so much to Jasmine, Chris, Andres for all of your wonderful advice today. Um, and I also want to highlight what Chris said in a chat, like, don't work with people who don't want to help you. Like, there's, there's so many people in this world, like, just because someone, like, doesn't want to help you doesn't mean you have to work with them. Like, you can just say thank you next. I mean, you don't, that's like the same thing. Like, I feel like for my younger self, like, I worried a lot about what other people thought of me. Like, that was a huge blocker. But once I realized that I'm not here to, to impress everyone, I'm not here to please anyone. Like it's not my job to please everyone. And yeah, there's, a, I think it's a human, it's easy to focus on like that 1% of people who are like not very wholesome. Um, but most people in this world are nice. So don't let them get to y'all. I don't know. That was like, for me, that, that's like the one thing that kind of held me back for, well, for a lot of my college life. Um, yeah, so that wraps up our wonderful panel today. Definitely um, join Design Buddies, connect with Design Buddies, connect with all of our panelists with the link Shayna set in the chat. And thank you so much, Shayna, for being our friendly moderator today. We really appreciate it. Um, dropping a lot of useful links in the chat as well. And also connect with your fellow buddies on the networking sheet. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop live streaming to YouTube. So